yeah, I'm good to go. We'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. We are going to make a slight change and start with the presentation first. And we have an e bodyguard demo, most heart. And Daryl, do you have anything else to say before we start? Uh, no, just that I want to thank our presenters for being here today, and I want to turn it over to them and uh, let them make their introductions. And uh, we'll do the roll call and other um, housekeeping items after the presentation. Thank you very much. And it is my honor and privilege to introduce the youngest speaker of the House of Texas and youngest Lieutenant Governor in the state of Texas, um, Lieutenant Governor Ben Barnes. He is here with us today. So without further ado, I'd love for you to have your moment and speak, Ben. Thank you, Governor. Alyssa. There's, there's a little misleading uh, information about that. Uh, about that introduction uh, when uh, using the word youngest uh, that that was uh, that was true 50 years ago it's it's not true today but it's fortunate for y'all that uh, that I'm speaking to you by phone and not by zoom so at least you don't have to look at me but uh, but I'm delighted to be here and it, and I and I, I w wish I had an opportunity to meet each one of you personally but uh, but I I wanted to uh, take about a few moments, and, and I really mean a few moments, uh, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, history. And it's very in interesting how history ties in uh, 50 years ago, 53 years ago, with, with what, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first 911 call was made in 1968. 1968 was a very turbulent year and probably of the 30, 40, 50 people on this call, many of you were probably not even born in 1968. But 68 was a, a was a watershed election year in the United States, and it was also the year that, unfortunately, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and Nixon and Johnson had had a presidential election, a showdown over over, over the Vietnam policy. But it was also the first year that a 9/11 call was ever made. And the 9/11 call was made, <laughs> it's, uh, in which is remarkable that there's there's this coincidence. The 9/11, the first 9/11 call made in the United States was made not from someone in New York calling someone uh, in, in 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 their in their emergency facilities or in Los Angeles or Chicago. It was made in in Haleyville, Alabama. Uh, and it had 40, and the population of Haleyville, Alabama is 4,100 people. And it happened to be made by the Speaker of the House of the Alabama legislature to a member of Congress. That was the first 911 call ever recorded in the history of 911. And uh, that, that year, I was Speaker of the House, and I knew the Speaker from Alabama that made that call, but I was Speaker of the House, and I had an occasion to use 911 to call because uh, some one of my secretaries said that you call 911 and you can get everybody at the same time and and the there was a a, a, de a huge demonstration going on on the campus of the University of Texas against Vietnam about 2000 people and they had set fire to some ROTC barracks that, that were on the, on the edge of the campus and at, at literally the University of Texas campus was on fire and so I too made a 111 call uh, but it was it was it was not the first call but the, the, you know the people on this call know the very significant role that, that 911 has played during the last 50 years and and the the, the, the this emergency support system of of, of at and t has has been a remarkable tool for the united states and for our people and for our safety and and for the quality of our lives and now there's a new generation of 911 systems called new gen 911 in many states that are, that, are, that is already in, in operation and with this is coming options that that and a change of technology that will continue that continues to amaze me because it, the the accuracy and 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 the data that's being gathered and 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 the and this data that's going to be a, I'll use the word official data data that can be used in court for prosecution data that can be used to make people's lives safety not only safer not only on on a on an immediate response to the to the call but uh, the technology that you're going to hear about 
that uh, that that Melissa and and her and E Bodyguard has developed it even even as another new dimension to uh, to nine eleven and and the new system they got and and this this new technology is is, is I think is going to be a, a a giant step. There's a lot of great things that have happened to nine one one in in the in the last fifty years, but I think uh, as with uh, so the other wonderful things in our life is medicine, the vaccines that's been developed to to to, to save our lives from the, the virus we have now, and other things that's happened are remarkable. And in ten years from now, the medicine we'll be using to treat ourselves will ninety percent of that medicine is not those drugs have not even been explored today. So we're living in a changing world. Nine eleven is changing, and e bodyguard is 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 providing a very significant leadership role in changing that technology uh, to to put together the the accuracy and assurance that uh, that evidence that they, they can gather we can be later supported in the court process and another tool to make America a safer place. Uh, Melissa, thank you for letting me. Uh, uh, do a very feeble job of giving a history lesson, but I'm proud of the progress that 911's made, and I'm proud of the progress that E Bodyguard's made. And I'm, I, like everybody else on the line, are, is interesting to hear what you've got to say and the other presenters what you've got to say, because I think this is a very exciting day. And thank you all. Thank you, Governor. Do we have Andrew Dameron from Denver 911? Yep, I'm here. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Um, Andrew is going to show the technology and how it works currently inside of a 911. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay. Um, just to kind of preface this a little bit, uh, one of the one of the things that Denver and I know Jeffcom has been doing the same thing. Uh, we've been working with Melissa and the folks at eBodyGuard. They came to us and asked for our help in refining the technology a little bit to make sure that as they're developing this public safety tool. Um, it's something that is providing accurate, uh, especially location information um, to 911. Oh, I get my own slide. That's great. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the work we've been doing, you know, the, the first time we ran a test with eBodyGuard here in Denver, you know, for example, some of the addressing was, was not coming through correctly. And we were getting locations uh, that were, were way off. So they made some, we gave them that feedback. They made programming changes. Um, and, uh, and all the tests since have been working very well. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the message that I've been trying to get out is that, you know, any chance that we get as an industry to work with, with companies like eBodyGuard who are developing this stuff um, to try and make sure that, that it's, it's a usable tool so that when our call takers and dispatchers start receiving these alerts, we, we can be reasonably assured that it's accurate information and, and, uh, and, and actionable so that we can get help to the right people. Um, the, the app itself, um, I think, Melissa, are you gonna kind of talk through how it works? Um, so I'm gonna do that after you show the actual demonstration. I'm gonna go through the screens. Do Or do you want me to vice versa it? Um, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to kind of talk through it. I don't, um, I know, I, I don't have anything as far as uh, images go. I can kind of talk through what, what we see. Um, okay, and, you know, do you the, have those screens? I thought we had those screens. No. Yeah, no, did not receive those. You did not receive those, okay. No. All but right. the, the important thing for the, for the audience here to understand just from, from our perspective is that we are getting accurate lat long um, from calls that are being made. They're VoIP phone calls currently, although Melissa, I think, is going to talk about maybe some additional programming changes there. Um, but uh, they're VoIP phone calls that are providing accurate lat long uh, that's coming through our Viper phone system. It's uh, translating. There we go. That's a screenshot from... Uh, from Heather. Oh, okay. That's a screenshot from out of state. But... Um, we're getting accurate lat long. It's translating directly into CAD. Um, and so just as, as this product rolls out, um, you know, anybody who starts receiving calls from this app, uh, the eBodyGuard e folks have been very responsive in, in making programmatic changes to ensure that it's, uh, it's, it's a usable tool. Okay. 
So we're not going to show a demo today is what you're saying. So I got it. Okay. So as it comes across the screen, do you just want to walk them through screen by screen or do you want me to do that? Um, I go ahead. Okay. So the user then presses the SOS button. Okay. On the app or voice activates the um, application. And we can do that up to 30 feet away. It can be in a purse, it can be, you know, wherever. And um, so I'm gonna save questions until the end. Daryl is actually going to indicate when the questions are open. Um, and then what I want you guys to do is, is, let, is uh, know that it is a live bi-directional communication with your 911 telecommunicators, okay? At the same time that they're talking to your telecommunicators, we are audio recording the, the actual incident, okay, at the same time. We have a SIP proxy that we have set up that communicates with your trunk. As that's happening and occurring, the GPS is accurate within 12 feet. It's from the handset wireless and we do not use cell phone tower technology, all right? I'm not gonna tell you how, at this time, it's patent pending. Um, and we are FBIC just compliant. I'm gonna go through the uh, screens at this time. Again, questions at the end, here we go. What we are not, I'm gonna talk about what we are not first. We are not sending you more calls to your call center. This is what we are. We are specializing in vulnerable communities like domestic violence, elderly abuse, and domestic violence abuse in the disabled communities, okay? Um, we're focusing especially on ancillary needs around medical, mental health, emergency evacuation plan, vehicles, pets, and family members. They're gonna have all those needs as well. Text to 911 is going to be an option for them because they may have hearing impaired issues. They may be in a precarious situation. So they need to text to 911 inclusive of other situations like the voice activation and that red text, um, that red SOS button. So this safety card I was referring to, that safety card is immediately going to go to 911 if they press this red SOS button. Now what's inclusive in that safety card? That's what we're gonna talk about right now. This is going to have all that salient data that I'm referring to that I talked about right here, medical, mental health, emergency evacuation, vehicles, pets, and family members. Okay, I'm gonna go through this fast, but I'm gonna have, I'm gonna open it up at the end for questions, okay? So here's, here's all the different options. The disaster preparedness family evacuation plan, if they're living in a disaster area, family information. Now, all of us have about 4.6 seconds of a, of a detention span on an app. So we are auto-populating data as much as possible because we wanna grab that data. Here's your pet information. Here's your vehicle information. Here's your medical and safety card information. If they do give us medical information, they're gonna re release that HIPAA statement, okay? Here's the medical information right here. It's auto-populated as much as possible. Okay, we're gonna get into some protection information. Here's the protector, uh, the protection orders. Why are we doing this? Because almost one out of five of the murders out there are connected to an intimate partner violent um, relationship. And this is over a 30 year study from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. They have the capability to upload documents for us. We're gonna put an expiration date on that. And you're gonna be able to see that immediately from the 911 center. So you can verify that, okay? Sometimes I'm afraid of, okay. So I've been asked this multiple times. How accurate is that data? Okay, four or five incidents it will take from a domestic violence person before they even ask for help from 911. So this data means that they have already preset this data in here. They are probably in a cycle of abuse relationship if they are even setting this up. 
So here's the next piece I want, to, I want everyone to be aware of. From 2010 to 2014, 22% of law enforcement officer line of duty deaths occurred while responding to a call for service involving a domestic dispute. This is why we're going after this particularly. So then the mental health impact, intimate partner violence results in more than 18.5 million mental health care visits each year. And then we're gonna teach about safety plans, personal safety plans and intimate partner violence safety plans. And what's the end game in all of this for us on Ed E Bodyguard? So I don't know if everybody knows this, but Colorado is on an e-discovery solution already, and we need to involve the CAD. So we, at this time, we have the RMS, and we are going to, let's say a domestic violence occurs, we're gonna grab that domestic violence crime and we're gonna then combine that with body cam, CAD and RMS, that's the MVP, the, the minimum viable product. The regional pilot launches here next week. Who's involved? Denver, Arvada, Lakewood, CSP so far. And I'm not here to talk about that today, although I will address some questions if you have a question on it. Um, and this is the overview of that. But the question that we will want to ask you all is Nina actually gave me some suggestive thoughts around the class of service that I should come in as. And they said, look, states have all sorts of class of services around voice over IP, and it could be voice over IP mobile, it could be nomadic. Why don't you just come in as voice over IP? So Daryl, you have a polling question for them. I should stop sharing, correct? Yes, um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat. Okay. So this is a link to a one question survey, Google survey, and I'm going to, um, that's in the chat now, so I'd like everybody to go, whoops, let me try that again. Instead of sending it to one person, I'll send it to everybody. So click that link, go to the, Go to the poll and we'll view the results. Arrow, I'm getting an arrow so the form can only be viewed by users and organizations. Well, that would be because I set it up wrong. Let me fix that real quick. Won't take but a second. I've done that quite a bit. Yes. Okay, try the link again. Yeah, that's working. We can watch these real time as they come in. Daryl, this is Holly. For yeah. those of us who are not uh, 911 Saviance, would you say what those acronyms are? I know what VoIP is, but. Sure. So, VoIP. Yeah, so the three options that, that are presented, and these are four letter codes that come through with the 911 call, uh, called a class of service. VoIP is voice over internet protocol. VMBL is VoIP mobile. So a VoIP call from a mobile device. VNOM is VoIP nomadic. So a VoIP call from a nomadic device, which is a little bit different than a mobile device, but it means that it, the location can change uh, from time to time. It's a little like watching a very slow paced horse race. <laughs> yeah. We'll give it just a few more seconds here. I've got 28 responses and we've got 59 people on the call. Um, not everybody has to, it, it's not mandatory that you vote. So I don't know at what point we need to cut it off, but we're probably getting close. All right, we're not getting any more responses. So I'm gonna say that's probably good. So it looks like 
VoIP was the um, overwhelming uh, selection. So I guess my only question with that, uh, Melissa, is if, if the calls are coming in with a VoIP class of service, will there be any other indication that the caller might be um, you know, moving or, or not in a static location? Yeah, that's on our product roadmap to actually send that in through the map interface so that they can see where they're moving. That's coming. Great. Great question, actually. All right. Did you want to open it up now? I'm sorry, Melissa, I think it's back to you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm finished with the, okay. my portion, if you want to open it up for questions Great. now. If anybody has any questions for Melissa, um, I think now would be the, the time. So if you, um, if you have questions, go ahead and either raise your hand or just um, unmute yourself and ask. Melissa, this is Bruce Romero with Arapahoe County 911 Authority. Uh, when you and I talked about this before, I thought there was, and I'm, I apologize if you covered this before I got here, I was a little late to the meeting, but I thought there was another class of service that you were going to be presenting to give us an indication that this was, um, that this was a possible domestic violence type of situation. Yes, and that is the DVA. It will come through. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, that will come through with the first name, last name in the naming. Uh, okay. It's not going to come in through the class of service, Bruce. Okay. When the, when the victim of domestic violence pushes that red SOS button, it will come through as DVA, the next gen code. Um, and it will say Melissa Hart slash EBG slash DVA. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And we're teaching that through the pilot um, agencies. And then it also will say, do not call back in your screens. And it will also say that all the way to the MDC. Okay. Thanks. It was just my misunderstanding. No, it, it wasn't your misunderstanding. I didn't teach that on this call. Gotcha. So Melissa, something that you and I have talked about is, um, you know, right now it's focused on domestic violence, um, you know, people who, who need particular um, assistance with that, with that issue. Um, one of the things that I know that there are others in the state looking at is whether or not there is a way to deliver information to the 911 center about other types of issues like disabilities or accessibility needs. And, um, you know, there are other services out there that kind of get into that area like Smart 911. I was wondering if, if you would talk a little bit about the possible future use of this for other types of things other than just uh, domestic violence. Yeah, great question. So we are focused on that first use case um, just for this pilot. Um, just to prove out the integration portions of this pilot. And obviously then once you prove out one integration, then um, you can expand into other integrations. But as you can see, um, the setup of all those details in the app will support other um, and any and all of those services needed. So disabilities of mental, medical conditions can support any of those disabilities as I brought up. Thank you. And I see Billy has his hand up. Hi, good morning, uh, Melissa. Thank you for sharing that. I like that fact that you added a family member to me too. So you got extra people in the house as well. That's a cool feature to have on there. Uh, my other question is regarding your, your PowerPoint slide number 17. 
So if we pull that up, slide number 17 on the top, where it's at, um, like the UIP uh, packing. And I'm Jeff and I utilize the sign language interpreter, as you can see right here. And um, so what happened is when I call in, I call in through a video relay service interpreter. And I wonder if that trackable on the dispatcher side to people who are like, oh, calling in. Um, let me look at slide 17. So I'm making sure I'm on the same page with you, okay? Okay. All right. So you want, can you clarify your question again and say that again, if, if it's trackable, which portion is trackable? Okay. So if you pull up slide number 17. Yep. I'm on slide number 17. I'm looking at it. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I can't point it out to the audience and you see we put it on my screen. Here, let me so, share so. it. Let me pull it up. Let me point it up. Let me pull it up. Okay, so everybody can look at it together. Okay, is that okay? Go ahead. Lovely. Thank you. See where it said type on the top right corner, type of calls that are coming into your dispatcher side there? Yeah, voice so, over IP. Yep. My question is if someone calls in through the video related interpreter to that, and is it trackable that way or not? I don't know if it is. That's my question. Is it trackable like in the system? Can we go back and be able to track that and pull that? Is that what you're asking? What I mean by maybe I should use better verbiage in there. Um, will you be able to find me? Yes, we can find if you I within call 12. The, uh, video relay interpreter, can you find me if I use a video relay call? Because, like, a lot of times right now, if I call people up, they have this comes up on the screen, it looks like it's a scam because calling in from a video relay interpreter phone number, the main owner number, them, you won't see my number on your screen. You'll see the interpreter number on your screen. Okay, are you asking, can I locate you? Holly, if can clarify that, Holly would know better way to speak in your language. So this is Holly. Billy is asking, when a deaf person calls through video relay service, okay. there is a third party involved in that call. You have the okay. deaf person, you have the 911 dispatcher, and then you have an interpreter that's connected with VRS. Got it. Billy is asking whose number shows up, whose like geolocation shows up, the VRS interpreter or the deaf person? Because Thank if you. it's the VRS interpreter, that address is not going to match where the deaf person is based and where they're calling from. Thank you. Thank you. That's super helpful. He initiates the call, correct? So the deaf person oh, calls oh. VRS and they give VRS, they, they say to VRS, I need to call 911. VRS okay then has a system where they can locate the closest PSAP, VRS connects to that PSAP. Mm -hmm. okay. But I don't know whose number actually shows up for the 911 dispatcher. I don't know if it's the deaf person's VRS number or if it's the interpreter number. So, so I don't know who initiates that call. The way that you're talking about your tech and the way that you've set it up, we would we would have to have a conversation, okay, about how that we would set up your translation services through eBodyGuard, because the way that we would initiate a call for Billy, okay, is that we would have him from the handset wireless, all right, set it up so that it is his device, okay and then integrate you into his e-bodyguard because we don't want to interrupt his safety. Okay, does that make sense? Because it's gotta be him that is being responded to from a safety perspective. And then you, you would still be known because you would be his e-bodyguard contact. We would send you, we would send you information. We, we will, we'll talk, what, I need your email. We'll talk about this offline, not on this call, about the technology. Does that make sense, Polly? Yeah, I appreciate you. And we can be happy to discuss more down the road. Thank you, appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, we, we need to set that up. And this is Daryl. I think more broadly, I think this highlights that 
um, these types of app-based services, um, I think they create a challenge for accessibility in terms of video, you know, customers who are, who are used to using video relay services and things like that. Um, but I think with any new technology, it's, you're going to have to find ways to make it work with all of the uh, different approaches to making a 911 call. Absolutely, Daryl. Yep. Well, and and correct me if I'm wrong. And again, this is from the last time you and I, Melissa, uh, spoke, and then also from the chief of police meeting that I attended in Lakewood. The the alley screen will populate with the information, but it's also going to open up a text to 911 for the caller to communicate with the 911 operator. Correct. Correct, Bruce. So that would be an option for someone that is deaf, hard of hearing, or speech impaired to be able to communicate through text to 911 rather than the video relay service, I believe. That's correct. So what we want to be able to enable is the ability for as many vulnerables as possible to have direct to 911. So, and then okay. for, for Holly, for example, to know that they are doing so. Okay. Okay. So that's why we have that e-bodyguard contact, be, you know, connection as well. So Holly knows without breaking any NINA laws, because I know that we standards, right? So that's, that's what we're doing on the back end as well. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Any other questions? Sounds like that might have been it. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. Really appreciate it. Oh, wait, Billy, do you still? I see Billy has his hand up. I don't know if that's from before or if that's new. No, oh, sorry, I'm, it didn't go down. I mean, oh, okay. thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate that. It's just supposed to go down. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. Uh, so, Melissa, thank you very much. Um, we'll let you go and, and uh, we'll move on with our, um, with our housekeeping items. But I want to thank you very much for being here today and presenting to us. Thank you so much for having us. We'll have a, have a great day. See you. Great. Bye-bye. So now I'm going to share my screen so we can follow along. Can everybody see my tabs here? Yep. Should be able to see the agenda now. Okay. So Holly, I'll let you uh, do the roll call. This is Holly. All right. Uh, representing CCI, Steve, Mike, or Marie. Representing CML, Megan. Hi, I'm here. Representing uh, accessibility community, Cheryl. I know she popped on and then said she wasn't gonna be able to stay. Um, representing at large is Matthew or Luke. And Carl, I did receive um, information from Matthew that he just does not feel like he is able to participate um, in the task force anymore just with some new jobs that he's taken over. So he has resigned. So that position currently is vacant. Um, I did ask Luke if he had an interest in taking on a permanent role and he said he just does not have the capacity right now. Um, it looks like Billy has agreed to be an alternate in that position. So, so Billy is on the call right now. Um, Billy, if that's something maybe you want to consider becoming a full-time member and replacing Matthew, um, we could provide a little bit more information. Oh, that being, yes. All right. Daryl or Carl, what does that look like in terms of um, would we want to put that out at the next meeting and take a vote for that to fill that at-large position? So I think um, 
Go ahead, Carl. Go ahead, Daryl. Go ahead, Daryl. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think, you know, if we have um, a nomination, uh, I think it's really up to you, Carl. We could take a vote today uh, on that, or if you want to hold off till the next meeting so people have time to um, to let us know if they're interested, we can we can consider that. But it, it's up to you. I think it might be best just to agenda the item so we have it and nobody could say anything against it. And then we'd also give more information to Billy. I'm sorry, you were a little muffled. So you were saying you want to do it today or or wait till next meeting? Of course, stuff I'm used to, we would have to agenda it, put it on making sure we have the agenda. Gotcha. Understood. For the next meeting. And then that way we could also provide more information to Billy or whoever would be else would be interested. Sounds good. So Holly, I think we'll just continue with the roll call and then uh, we'll put that on the agenda for the November meeting. This is Holly, sounds good. Billy, you can reach out to me and we can talk a little bit more about what that role looks like. All right, representing um, BESP, Tim Kunkelman. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Also representing BESP, Mary Jane. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Uh, representing the ILEC, Wes. Yes, here. Representing ILEC, Darla. I'm here. Representing wireless, Patrick. <laughs> also representing wireless, Monica. Present. Representing CELEC. Uh -huh. Carl Patrick showing on the list of here. Or he did a second ago. He just popped back off. Hey, this Go is ahead. Patrick T Mobile. Sorry. This is Holly. Thank you, Patrick. I got you. Thank you. Uh, Ray or Lindsay? Yep, this is Ray. I'm here. Thank you. Also representing CLEC or VoIP, Jay or Erica. Case leaders here. And getting into representation for 911, I have Jody from Gunnison. I'm here. Danette from Morgan County. Here. Jeremy or Jennifer from Grand Junction. Jeremy Duncan's present. And Jennifer's present. Thank you. Representing um, Larimer, Kimberly, Val, or Tracy. Good morning. This is Kimberly. I'm present. Thank you. Uh, representing Adcom, Jackie, or Amy. This is Jackie. I'm here. Representing Eagle County, Beth. Good morning, I'm here. Representing Sterling, uh, Valicia or Paula? Delicious here. Alicia. I'm sorry, I do that every time. Oh, no worries. Uh, representing Jeffco, Jeff? Jeff Irvin's here. Representing Delta County, Connie? Connie is here. And representing Douglas? Uh, Dini or Shannon? Good morning, Shannon Burns here. And representing Denver, either Andrew or Jennifer? Andrew's here. Uh, representing Jeffcom, Vicki? Good morning. Uh, representing Aurora, Tina or Scott? Good morning, Holly. Scott is here. Representing Thornton? Sean, Brandy, or Ashley? Ashley's here. And representing West Co, Mandy or Matt? Mandy's here. Representing Garfield? Uh, Carl, Carl Tom, Monica? Carl is here. And representing Boulder, Patty 
or Christine and I saw Patty and the Yeah, chat. Patty's on. Thank you. Awesome. All right, and we have 90%. So we do have a quorum. And I will turn it back over to Carl. This is Carl. Thank you, Holly. Also, for those that have not, whose names were not called, there is a, um, a link in the chat. It's free to sign up. The next item is approval of the minutes, July 2021. Can I get a motion to approve or are there comments about the minutes? This is Kimberly. I'll make a motion to approve. This is Vicki. I second. Vicki, I second. Vicki, thank you. And Kimberly, thank you for the motion. All in favor or any opposed say aye. Seeing none, motion passes. The next item is standard reports, the PUC staff update, Daryl and Holly. Thank you, Carl. Um, 911 grant update. Um, Holly, do you have any updates for the group regarding the status of the uh, grant reimbursements? Uh, this is Holly, no updates. We've got pretty much other than like maybe four or five uh, authorities that have submitted some type of paperwork. Um, I feel pretty good about that. Everything has to be submitted by the end of the year. So if you haven't submitted any type of paperwork, I imagine you're probably not on this call right now because we've definitely been talking about it on this call. Um, we've sent out email notification reminders and the next step will be for me to start calling and harassing you. <laughs> so if you are on the call, You'll be harassed shortly. Thank you, Holly. Yeah, I think um, you said that about four or five that we don't we haven't received anything for the first payment and for the second payment. You, th I think you said the other day we had like fourteen left. Yep, for the second payment about fourteen, and for no submission at all, I think there were four or five right now. So okay. out of fifty-seven. So we're doing pretty good to get this done by the end of the year. Um, PUC proceedings. There is a 988 rulemaking. Uh, proceeding number was pending at the time of this report, um, but it has been issued now. I won't take the time to look that up right now, but um, there is a, a 988 rulemaking right now. For the most part, it won't affect you guys, uh, but I did want you to be aware of it because it's something that um, um, is really based off of the 911 rules. Um, so it, it's very similar to what, what we just um, approved through the 911 funding rulemaking. I don't anticipate that any of it will be controversial. Um, we're hoping to have those in place by the end of the year so that we don't have to issue temporary rules. And my screen went all pink. Um, a proceeding was opened to set the 911 surcharge rates and distribution percentages for 2022. The initial recommendations were included in the proceeding and deadlines for comment and reply comments were provided. The commission is uh, required by statute to issue final rules uh, or excuse me, final decision on what those surcharge rates will be by October 1st. The initial recommendations were a state 911 surcharge of nine cents per 911 access connection per month, a threshold for ETC applications of $1.81, per 911 access connection per month, prepaid wireless 911 charge rate of $1.63 per transaction, and distribution percentages that were consistent with statute for both prepaid wireless 911 charge revenues and the state 911 surcharge revenues. Um, I've received comments from El Paso Teller 911 and Douglas County filing jointly, Boulder Regional Emergency Telephone Service Authority and CTIA, the Wireless Industry Association. Uh, the comment deadlines have passed, um, so we're, we're analyzing those comments now, and I'll be discussing the comments with our uh, legal team as well as the um, commissioners themselves um, before a final uh, order is issued. I'm looking to possibly have that order out by September 22nd, but we can push it all the way back to the 28th if we need to and still meet that October 1st deadline. Um, 
We have had a couple of workshops now on the topic of 911 reliability rules. Uh, the commission back in January of this year actually directed me to um, hold a 911 reliability rulemaking. So we will be doing that fairly soon. Um, the only thing that was holding us up was wanting to get through the 911 funding rulemaking first. Um, if you have not seen, if you were not able to attend that that first workshop, that workshop is on the task force's YouTube page now. Um, I just held a listening session for this yesterday where I took additional comments and feedback from, from the uh, community on that. And if you're, if you would like to, that will be posted uh, probably by next week. Um, if you have additional thoughts or comments or would prov provide any draft language for me to consider, uh, please send that to me. Um, once I have all of that and I've discussed the, uh, the different comments that I've received with our legal team, we'll be putting together some draft rules and issuing it as a notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, and of course, at that time, people will, also, will have an additional opportunity to submit comments or intervene in that proceeding if you'd like to. FCC proceedings, the work of the FCC's 901 Fee Diversion Strike Force is nearing its end. The, uh, as of the writing of this report, the reports from the three working groups are being finalized. Um, those are, are fairly close to being done and um, there will be a, another um, meeting of the FCC's, uh, of the Strike Force on the 17th of this month. Um, I, can tell you that I don't believe everyone will be happy with all of the provisions of the report, uh, but I can tell you that it is the result of a lot of negotiation and consensus building uh, within the strike force. So, you know, I think that old adage that um, a, a successful compromise is one in which nobody is completely happy. And I think that will probably be the case in this case. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, in terms of radio expenses, which I think is something that a lot of people were concerned about, I think um, the, the final results of the report will be uh, satisfactory from, from Colorado's point of view in terms of um, ensuring that our current statute falls within the, um, the definitions of the FCC. Of course, part of that will also depend on follow-up action from the FCC. This, is just, this report is strictly a recommendation the FCC will have to take um, action to turn that into rules. And uh, there may be additional um, actions that would have to be taken by Congress based on the recommendations from the report. And beyond that, I can't really go into more detail because um, you know, giving information about what's in the report before it's completely finalized has been highly discouraged by the FCC. Uh, so we'll, we'll just leave it there. Um, Federal legislation, there is a very long list of current legislation that touches on 901 in different ways. Um, in the interest of not making this a 10 page report, I just listed items that have shown some movement or activity since the last task force meeting. People who have been watching Congress for the last several years know that there are a lot of bills that get introduced and then nothing ever happens with them. Uh, so bills that have actually had some activity in the, in the last uh, 60 days would be the Emergency Reporting Act, which passed the House and is now in the Senate. Um, as of the 21st of September, it was read in the Senate in the uh, Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. This is a bill that would direct the FCC to issue summary reports on any activation of the Disaster Information Reporting System, or DERS, of seven days or longer. Um, right now, I think the FCC sometimes issues summary reports following the activation of DERS, but it, it's somewhat sporadic. Um, the Protect 911 Act was um, introduced in the House on July 1st and referred to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. This is a bill that would direct the director of the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration to collect data from the states regarding suicide rates among 911 telecommunicators and would also authorize NHTSA to offer grants for wellness programs within ECCs. Um, while it directs NHTSA to offer grants, it doesn't actually have an appropriation tied to it. So I, I think there would have to be a separate appropriation in order for that grant program to be funded. Uh, but it, it is um, a potentially beneficial um, program for the 911 centers across the country and particularly here in Colorado as well. Um, implementation of state 911 surcharge and flat 
wireless uh, prepaid 911 surcharge. In July, there were uh, close to a million dollars um, distributed from the state 911 surcharge. In August, it was closer to 617,000. That, that second number is actually more um, in line with what we were expecting, the 617,000. And that is um, the reason it goes up and down is stri strictly because of the deadlines by which the carriers have to remit uh, those surcharges to the commission in order for them to be distributed. So in one in May, they or excuse me, in June, excuse me, yes, in June they were actually below what we expected, and they were higher in July because of of late submissions. Prepaid wireless 911 charge distributions have actually been a lot more consistent, um, close to a million or a little over a million, like they were for July and August. Um, and those are coming from the, the retailers that are selling prepaid service, remitting those, those funds to the uh, Department of Revenue, which is then distributing those to the 911 governing bodies. Um, one, one comment on the state 911 surcharge distributions. I know that there's been some confusion as to how those are showing up on your bank accounts. Those are being direct deposited as an electronic fund transfer, and it shows up as state nine trade pay which is not very helpful at all. Um, I've talked to our uh, vendor, Solix, who actually collects those on behalf of the commission and distributes them to the 911 governing bodies to see if we can get that, um, get that changed as to how it shows up on your bank statement. So it's a little bit more um, descriptive, but if you see state nine trade pay on your bank statement with a deposit, that's what that is. It's the state 911 surcharge distributions. Upcoming deadlines, November 1st is the last day to file an application with the commission to increase your emergency telephone charge and have any hope of it being approved in time for February 1st. That's if everything goes perfectly. So really the sooner you file that application with us, the better chance it has to be approved in time for you to make your 60 day notification to the carriers for a February 1st effective date. As a reminder, the statute now requires that new surcharges, new emergency telephone charges rather, go into effect either February 1st or June 1st of each year. So if you miss that November 1st deadline, um, then it will you will have to wait for the next one, which will be for a June 1st effective date. Um, the threshold itself, as I mentioned earlier, is being considered by the commission right now, will be set by the commission by October 1st for a January 1st effective date. And it puts us in a little bit of a weird position, just so you know, the, the, the threshold is not effective till January 1st, but if you need to go above that threshold uh, for on a February 1st effective date, you have to file by November 1st. Um, but I would just watch and see what the commission fi um, uh, approves for its um, threshold, because you can go up to that threshold um, without filing an application with the commission and if we know that that's what the threshold is going to be as of January 1st, then that's what uh, you would need to um, need to plan for. And I know that's a little bit confusing. So if anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer those. Um, and before I conclude the report, I do want to say that the state of 911 report was approved by the commission yesterday. Uh, so that will be getting transmitted to the Colorado General Assembly fairly shortly. Um, in my conversations with the commissioners about the state of 911 report, I did get a couple of action items from them that uh, we need to follow up on. Uh, one of which is to talk about um, uh, operational standards for public safety answering points in the state. And um, the concern being that there are no operational standards, that it's really up to each individual jurisdiction uh, to come up with those. The commission does not have the authority to impose uh, operational standards for public safety answering points, but the commissioners have directed me to investigate the possibility of voluntary standards for public safety answering points in the state. So that's something that I'll be talking about with this group um, over the next few months as to what the best way to approach that is. And I'll be talking to our legal counsel as well, um, whether we want to, um, whether we, whether there's an appetite to, to address that, to come up with some operational standards that are voluntary uh, for, for all of the 911 centers in Colorado and what the best way to develop those standards would be. Um, 
And the other, oper the other uh, action item I received had to do with 911 outage reporting. As a lot of you are aware, the commission has the authority to require 911 outage reporting as it relates to basic emergency service, which is the point from the selective router or the ingress to the ESI net to the demarcation point with the PSAP. We don't have authority to require reporting before or after that point. Um, however, the commissioners believe that it's important for the for uh, the legislature to know about the reliability of the whole 911 call flow, not just basic emergency service. And so they've directed me to um, look into a voluntary outage reporting uh, program. We've done something similar in the past with a PSAP outage reporting form. Uh, so we may be updating and dusting that off and uh, getting that out to the 911 centers, but also encouraging um, originating service providers to provide voluntary outage reporting as well. So we'll be contacting the 911 or the all, all of the telecommunications service providers in the state and encouraging them to do that. So um, be watching for that as well. And that was a long report, and I apologize for that, but I think I've covered everything. And if anybody has any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Did everybody fall asleep? We're still here. Okay, back to you, Carl. This is Carl. Thank you, Daryl, for the report. Um, our next item is DSP report Lumen. Hi, this is Tim, thanks. So we do have some uh, exciting news. I know it's been a long time coming, but the diverse path between, effectively between Gunnison and Buena Vista has been completed. And as of about last Tuesday, we've had uh, live traffic moving over that path. So a new diverse route uh, is uh, in the network and hopefully that will stem uh, any future outages that uh, Gunnison, Crested Butte, Lake City would experience when that path between Montrose and Gunnison would get cut. Uh, we are still working on, I was just checking, hopefully, I was hoping that maybe I got a report back, but we, we are working on grooming the 911 circuits onto that path uh, this week. That work started on Tuesday, and I was hoping to hoping to get a report saying that, that she had completed that work, but that should be done this week. And then that, that path will be fully operational in all aspects. I think that's all I've got. This is Carl, um, Tim, thank you. That is great news. Any questions for Tim? Okay, our next item, BSP report, Contrado. Hey, Carl, it's Mary Jane. I don't have anything to report today. Thank you. Thank you, agenda committee, Daryl. Oh, yes, I've got uh, present, presenters lined up uh, for the rest of this year, but if anybody has any suggestions or comments or suggestions or, um, yeah, suggestions, I guess, is, is what we're looking for on speakers or topics, feel free to send those to me. Thank you. Next item is bylaws. The, um, the report says no changes or suggestions from my bylaws committee. Kimberly, anything to add? Nope, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Next item is legislative committee. Jackie Louise. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not going to read the misuse of 911 draft, but it's in the report. If you'd like to take a look at it, any comments or um, questions or anything need to be, uh, if you send them to me, I can bring them up with the legislative committee. Um, Representative McCluskey has tentatively agreed to look at this. Um, and I did this week receive um, statistics and um, samples from call centers. And I'm in the process of reaching out to her to see the best way to get her that information. Um, Jennifer and Kathy, Ray, Jennifer Kirkland and Kathy Rayleigh were going to reach out to the police chiefs and sheriffs association, respectively. Um, we will need to make a determination on how to move forward on this legislation by October 15th, because I think, as you all know, that our draft will go to a drafter <laughs> and it may not be the same as what we give them. 
when it comes back out the other side, um, if the representative agrees to take this on. And let's see, what else? Vicki is gonna start taking minutes for the group. So those should be posted on a regular basis. Um, we are still going through the comments that we received from Bretza on House Bill 1293 cleanup. Um, we have not made any decisions. Um, if the group is going to move forward with any of those comments, we will need to do that by October 15th. And as Daryl talked about, the FCC rules were published. Um, we, the group that had, there were numerous on a group, I sent this out yesterday, the petition for reconsideration. Um, it's more of a, what my understanding is, the last thing to say that we've done, crossed all our, T's and dotted all our I's. Um, for the FCC, it is due um, the 16th of September and um, the, due to the attorney's um, schedule, we will need to finalize it and file it by the 13th. And again, I sent out an email to the legislative committee on that. If there's anybody here that wants more information who was not on the petition or who was on the petition, my question was only if you were on the petition, if you'd like to continue to be, um, if you don't want to be, if I'm assuming everybody wants to be, but if you don't want to be to let me know. And if there's anyone else who wants to be on the petition, let me know and we can get you at it. Um, but we will be trying to file that on the afternoon of the 13th. Are there any questions for me? Jackie, I do have one. I know I missed a couple of the meetings, but I know some of our discussions on the Proposed legislation also included if they call them landlines because we're having a problem with somebody that keeps on doing that. Yes, and we haven't really clarified that in the misuse of 911 yet. And so if you have some language we'd like to put in there, we we just haven't um we just called it the 911 system. So um I'm hoping that includes um the entire system, i.e. admin as well as. If I answered your question correctly, if I understood your question correctly. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. But if there's additional language somebody would like to um, add, please let me know. Even if you're not on the legislative committee, if you have comments, please let me know and I can bring them up to the group. Ms. Carl, are there any other questions for Jackie Lewis? Okay, um, seeing none, our, and thank you, Jack, for that. Yeah, thank you. The Equal Access Committee, Cheryl, sure, have a drop off. Holly or anybody else have anything? This is Holly. I'll just read what Cheryl sent in terms of a report that the Access Committee met on August 26. We had a presentation from Maggie Sims, who is with the Rocky Mountain ADA Center who presented on effective communication in emergencies. Um, additionally, Al Kenton from FEMA was on the call and discussed um, IPAWS. And then the next meeting will be held September 30th and Glenn will be presenting on uh, AES and WEA local warnings on what is audible and what is not. And that is it for Cheryl's access report. Ms. Carl, thank you, Holly, for that. Any questions for Holly? Okay, our next item is outage committee, Daryl. Thank you. I'll um, open the dashboard here so we can just take a look at it real quick. Um, it looks like a lot. One thing I do want to point out, if you're looking at this page, to look over here on the far right where it says BES outage, um, a lot of the outage reports we get are not actually basic emergency service outages, but they're being reported to us from uh, local exchange carriers anyway, and we do take those and put those in there, but I do want to uh, note that not all of these outages are what we would consider a basic emergency service outage, which is from the, as I mentioned earlier, from the selective router to the demarcation with the PSAP. 
um, and only the BES outages are shown in the graphs below. So where it says BES outage only, just wanna make sure that people are aware of that. Looking at it, um, outages as of today's date in each year, I think is a useful um, uh, graph to look at because it shows you know, whether we're having outages more frequently or less frequently than previous years up to this point. And we're actually looking pretty good. We've had six basic emergency service outages so far this year, um, which uh, by itself sounds like a lot, but compared to 2019 or 2018, that's it's a lot less. Um, we're right on par with where we were last year. Um, if you look at outages per month, we had three in January and then one each in March, April, May, and July, um, none in August. Um, and Continuing on, we have um, average duration per year. So the average duration is up this year compared to previous years, but the average customer count is down. And that's consistent with longer outages taking place in more rural areas instead of shorter outages in more urban areas. Uh, so that gives us an idea of the types of, of communities we need to look at in terms of uh, mitigation strategies and uh, possible action in terms of the um, you know, our 911 reliability rulemaking in the future, what can we do to help uh, decrease the uh, uh, outages in the rural areas, or at least to decrease the duration of those outages in the rural areas. Um, overall customer impact, this is measured in customer minutes. That's number of customers times the uh, duration of the outage in minutes. Um, that's down this year from 2020 or 2019. Um, I think it's even down slightly from 2018. You can see you, if you, by the way, if you go to this web page and hover over the points, it'll actually give you the numbers. So we're down, um, that's average uh, per impact. And then total impact, that's adding up the impact on, of all of the outages together. We are uh, also down there this year compared to the last two years and a little bit down from 2018. So the last year, that it was actually lower than this was uh, 2017. Um, the majority of our outages have been full outages, not just alley outages. So an alley outage is also considered a basic emergency service outage, and that's where the 911 calls are getting through, but alley is down. Uh, so two thirds of our, of our outages have been full outages as compared to alley only. And if you look at outage causes, um, exactly half of our outages, which is three, have been uh, due to accidental cable cut with one each of unknown where they were un CenturyLink was unable to determine the actual cause of the outage. Um, system failure, uh, I believe that one was a, a card that had to be reset and then one planned. Um, so with that, I will say that uh, we do have an, one active outage investigation ongoing right now that is uh, involving an outage that occurred in Kit Carson in Cheyenne counties. And we've had one meeting of the outage committee to discuss that uh, outage. And I think we've got a follow-up already scheduled if I'm not mistaken, I just can't find it on my calendar right now um, to discuss um, action items that came out of that first meeting. And with that, I'll just see if I can answer any questions that people have, or um, just let you know that the outage committee is, is still working on that active outage. And if anybody wants to join the outage committee who isn't, uh, just to let me know and we'll get you on that list. Thank you. Back to you, Carl. I'm Daryl. This is Carl. Daryl, thank you. Also, one of the things that Daryl's been working on on the outage committees is doing like a best operations plan moving forward from things that we're finding in these outages. And I think that'll definitely be appreciated. Yes, and since you All mentioned right. that, let me go ahead and show you show people how to get to that. Um, so if you go to the task force webpage and then click on committees and outage committee, um, first of all, there's a link to the dashboard page right here, outage dashboard. Um, but also on that page down here under 911 outage guidelines, there's actually two documents. One was created by Kimberly Culp um, and then workshopped through the uh, outage committee a little bit, and it's a very a very good document. Um, giving some um, some important tips on how to better prepare for outages. Um, but then the other document is 911 outage lessons learned and best practices. And these are things that we've gleaned from our special investigations over the over the last year. 
Um, so I would encourage people to take a look at that. And that's a living document that will change after every um, special investigation. We'll be adding to that over time to make it a better document. This is Carl, um, Daryl, thank you. Um, next item, prepaid and collections. There's no report. I know a lot of that work's also been done, being done in legislative committee. Carl, this is Holly. Apologies, I was taking minutes when Jackie was giving the report on the um, legislative information and I did have a question regarding that. Go ahead. Jackie, do you know like during those discussions around misuse of 911, um, were there any thoughts on adding language around misuse of 911 when it comes specifically to people calling, um, misusing 911 in relation to race or disability? I know we see that happening across the country all over the place, and I'm wondering if Colorado is considering adding language around that, like some of the other um, cities throughout the the country have done we actually did have some um discussion on that and um determined that because there's other places in the legislation that it's addressed that would we would leave it there and not um add it to the misuse of 911 because there's other places within legislation that if that's happening we have a recourse um, the misuse of 911 is mainly because there's nothing in state legislation that gives dispatchers any recourse for some of the abuse they've been taking. Okay. Um, but there is actually a recourse for disabilities and race and um, that kind of thing. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. And any other group, if I didn't phrase that right, just jump in there. <laughs> No, this is Carl. That is something, Holly, that we did have a lot of discussions because there are some places that have, and, and funny enough, some of them will call them Karen laws. But that is something we just we did discuss and kind of decided against that, right? At least for the moment, because there were other things that could handle it. Any other questions for Jackie? Uh, this is Carl. Our next item is reports committee. Um, Daryl. No report is due from to the commission at this meeting. Uh, the next report will be due at the following the November meeting. So we'll be watching for that. Um, as I did mention earlier, the state of 911 report is due to the legislature from the commission by September 15th. Um, the commission did approve that um, that report yesterday. So I'll be working on putting the cover letter on it and getting that transmitted to the legislature. But I do wanna take a moment just to thank everybody who submitted comments and suggestions, um, even just proofreading because it's impossible in a document that large to catch all of the typos myself. So I wanna thank everyone who took the time to look at that and, and provide feedback because it's extremely helpful. And that's all I have. This is Carl, they're all thank you. Next item, um, as a net user group, Kimberly. Hey, this is Kimberly, and we did have our meeting yesterday. So the update is as current as yesterday, so I'm not gonna go through all of the items, um, but from a big picture perspective from the EZNet, um, almost all of the PSAPs have been deployed. So just a few that are wrapping up, which is great. And now the EZNet users group is researching and waiting and discussing with Lumen on our next steps. And so we have a couple of requests in front of them, which is text connecting into the EziNet and traveling across the EziNet to the PSAP demarcation. Doesn't solve the issue for PSAPs needing to purchase technology to be able to receive the text, but it does offer additional network connectivity and then also reporting measures and transfers across state lines. So um, from an EziNet perspective, I would say we're, we're active and things are going very well. We don't have any priority tickets in the network. And Carl, that's all I have, but I will answer any questions if anybody has any. This is Daryl, I'd like to just add a little bit to that. Um, 
So one of the things that was discussed yesterday, and if you were unable to attend, this is an important one that I, I really think everybody should take a look at. Um, so that meeting hasn't been posted to the YouTube page yet, but it will be fairly soon. Is And Kimberly put it in her report here, that Vicki Hyatt demonstrated how PSAPs can check their abandonment and automatic rollover configurations. It's very important that every PSAP know what those configurations are and to let Vicki know um, if those need to be changed. Um, and I, I think because of the importance of that, I don't want to rely necessarily on everybody going in and checking for themselves. So I'm going to be contacting PSAPs directly to let them know what the settings are currently for their PSAP. And that way they know if they need to change those um, because there is an easy way to look that up, but if not everybody uh, does that or knows how to do that, um, I, I don't want those piece apps to get left out of this conversation. Um, it's in the Entrado Insights and um, it, the video actually will show you um, exactly how to get to that from the uh, IUP Entrado website. Kimberly, this is Shannon with Parker. Yes, Shannon. Can you put Vicki's contact information in there? Absolutely, I'll put it in the chat. Perfect. And I can also, if anybody would like uh, screenshots of how to navigate that information that we discussed yesterday and that Daryl just brought forward, I'm happy to do that. Um, I did get in and, and review all the configurations for, for my PSAPs and I need to make some changes. So it is absolutely a critical item, but I will put Vicki's contact information in the chat. But again, if you need some screenshots, just let me know. Hi, Kimberly, this is Jackie. Uh, we've been involved in a bunch of meetings, so sorry we missed yours yesterday. We still are having issues on our, our, our side with transfers in and transfers out and Entrado is aware of them and apparently has been still looking to find out what the problem is. So we did briefly bring up the transfers. I don't know if the transfers have been isolated to the 911 network. So if it's 911 to 911 or 911 to 10 digit or you know all of the issues you're experiencing. So if you could even send me just a summary email of where that's at so I can make sure that we're in the loop on it, that would be great. Yeah, no problem. It is 10 digit to 10 digit and 911 to 911. And the 911 specifically are going to the wrong agencies. Yeah, so the 911s are obviously something on the EziNet, the 10 digit CPE slash PBX, but the, the 911s are concerning and we would wanna be involved in that and have visibility in Lumen didn't um, brief us on that one. And I don't think they were fully aware of it being their issue. So I'll just, I know that Vicki's been engaged, but I will make sure that Cindy and Wes have the information too. Okay, thank you. You bet. This is Daryl and, and I see a chat message from Mandy Stolzheimer who said that um, after yesterday's meeting, she discovered that she does not have access to see her settings. Uh, so she suggests that everybody go into IUP and look, and, and I think that's very good advice. And I'll include in the chat as well of who you need to email to get access if you don't have access. They can make that change pretty quick for you. Kind of on that topic, has anybody noticed difficulty um, pulling up calls by call type in IUP? Has anybody tried to do that recently and had trouble? Because I've, I'm trying to do that um, going forward for the purposes of determining wireless call volume uh, for next year's um, distribution percentages, not, not 2022, but actually planning ahead for 2023. And I have been unable to pull those up. And I don't know if it's just, just on my account or if anybody else is having issues there. Has anybody tried recently to know whether they were able to access it or not? Daryl, this Sorry, Kimberly, go ahead. I was going to say this is Kimberly, and I will log in and let you know if I can Thank do you. it. You're welcome. Thank you. I was able to get it from a different report, but that one was not working for me at all, and I don't know if it's just my, my account settings or if it's a global thing. Gerald, do you mean in the original Clearview 
access? Uh, no, this is in the new uh, Intrado the new Insights. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly. The next item is GIS report, Matt. The uh, second NG911 GIS Lunch and Learn was on August 12th and uh, it went pretty well. We had a lot of discussion about functional elements within the NINA I3 standard, which uh, rely on locally sourced GIS data. Uh, that's all I have. Matt, thank you. This is Carl. Um, next item, public safety broadband update. Is Ed on the line? Okay. Our next item is PSCS report. I know they have a meeting today. Um, that has been joined. Okay, Swick report, Glenn, I didn't see him either. And then Division of Fire Prevention Control, I know Monica sent the report out to the group. Uh, Monica, are you lying or Bruce, do you have anything? Uh, she is not on uh, and uh, nothing further on that piece, just that it has been emailed out. Thank you. Next item, Colorado Resource Center, Bruce. Uh, so the only report we have is just to remind everybody that Monica Million uh, has moved on to a new position with Amazon Web Services. She and I are both um, doing some part-time work for the Resource Center to keep that going on a skeleton crew type of basis. But please, if you need anything from the Resource Center, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask, we will do our best to help anybody out that needs any assistance. Uh, we did send a uh, survey out statewide uh, at the request of the legislative committee on the 911 use, misuse. Um, we got 24 responses on that. Uh, Jackie, I don't know if you are still collecting that uh, data, if anybody else wants to respond, or are you still interested in that or is it pretty much closed at this point? No, if anyone else wants to respond, that's fine. I, um, I'm working on getting that information off to the legislator. Okay, great. Thank you. So, yeah, if you have not responded to that uh, to that uh, survey just yet, please uh, try to take time to get that uh, filled out if you have any data to share with uh, the legislative subcommittee so we can get that to the legislator that is planning to help us out with that piece. And other than that, uh, I think that's it. Bruce, thank you. Um, this is Carl. Next item is break for lunch, but we'll just go ahead and go to old business. Is there any old business? Seeing none, any new business? Okay. This is Jennifer, I have, sorry, I have one thing. Jennifer, go ahead. Um, thanks. On behalf of the Colorado Nina APCO chapter, we would like to uh, remind everybody that the um, registration for our conference, October 18th, 19th, and 20th is open. And we wanted to make everyone aware that if you're not able to attend the, the entire conference, we are offering a free pass to attend the vendor show only. Um, and you can go and I'll put the link for the registration for that. Yes, it's free, um, but we still would like you to register um, but I'll put a link for that into the chat. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And the flash day is already gone, isn't it? Or is it still active? No, flash day has passed. But registration is still open. Okay, thank you. It's always a good conference. Um, next item, any, any other new business? Okay, next item is open discussion because um, I'll turn this over to Daryl because our next meeting falls on Veterans Day, which is a holiday. 
Right, so normally we meet on the second Thursday of odd months, but that happens to be Veterans Day. So I wanted to see if um, there was any um, desire to meet, and we do we do probably need to still have a meeting instead of just cancel it because we have uh, election item matters to take care of. So my recommendation was uh, to move that to the 18th. Um, and that is what I've scheduled in on the calendar right now. So I wanted to make sure that that is um, amenable to the rest of the group. If you have objections to be moved to the 18th, I guess now would be the time to, to voice that. Um, in fact, we've already updated the calendar, so. Okay, seeing people saying sounds good and works for me in the in the chat, so I think we're good. Thank you. Is there anything else for open discussion? Okay, thank you everybody today that uh, joined us. We'll go ahead and ask for a motion to adjourn. Ms. Vicky, I move to adjourn. And a second. This is Wes, I second it. Thank you, Wes and Vicki. Anybody opposed? Seeing none, um, we're adjourned at 11.28. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Daryl and Holly, especially. Thanks, guys. So. Bye, all. <laughs>